Hello, little boy. What are you doing on this fine evening? Here, take Burwell, the Avenger. No? You don't? No one's home. All right, I'll put it back. So, what are you doing? Nothing? Just having a fun time. Not doing much, I see. Well, we can fix that. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Oh, oh that came off easy. Come with me, come with me. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to my house. My name is Chester, and the reason I've brought you here today in that little cage is because I need someone to talk to about the new SpongeBob game that came out a little while ago. Problem is, no one really cares anymore. You see, I got this cheeky little review copy, uh, because so that, you know, I could talk about the game when everyone's interested and when everyone's talking about it, so I can be, you know, hip and down with it, but I then decided that that was, in fact, cringe and uncool. I decided instead, rather than just trying to compete with everyone else, I'd just wait and, you know, catch you when you're not expecting it, and, uh, yeah, chat to you rather than having to compete with, like, the five other people that were going to talk about it. Now, because I have been waiting to catch you. Uh, I haven't really been paying much attention to what anyone else has been saying about this game. I haven't seen any other reviews or anything like that because, once again, that would be uh, cringe and lame, and I am none of those things. And if you disagree, I will put you back in the bag, okay? So everything I'm going to talk about here is my own opinion. Yes, I got sent the game, but I also bought multiple copies of the game anyway, so that hasn't really changed my opinion or anything like that. And realistically, you shouldn't listen to those plebs that I've already talked about anyway, for a very important reason, which is I've played this game three damn times, okay? I've played it on Switch, I've played it on PC, and I've played it on PlayStation 5, and I've 100 percented it on PlayStation 5, okay? So I know what I'm talking about. I am the most knowledgeable person about this game around, while you were all out there having fun playing the new Zelda. I was in here studying the blade. I was out there honing my skills while the rest of you were out know, living your lives. Are you sassing me? That look in your eye. You know what? I'm doing the rest of this with you in the bag, alright? Okay, well, the positive about being in the bag is that I can still talk to you. So, SpongeBob BC. Before content. Hey, get back in the back. So I've been playing a heap of uh, SpongeBob Cosmic Shake. I played it on PC when it first released. I then spent a few months playing Hogwarts Legacy and then came back to Cosmic Shake on PS5. Well, the PS4 version. Get back in the back! And then I played the Switch version. Now, it must be said, whichever version you do play of this game will greatly impact your overall experience. The PC version is lacking, but it is the most fine-tuned, the best running, and the nicest in just about every way. It's a much more cohesive and smooth experience. On PS5, it's a bit of a different story. I experienced lots more hitching, the occasional freezing, awkward jumps from cutscenes to gameplay, way longer loading screens, and strange anti-aliasing on models and a handful of other things. And the Switch version is just a little bit worse, but in reality, I bought the Switch version just to kind of support the game, not to approach it critically. Other people can do that. I am interested, though, to see if they do an iOS version, because the iOS version on um, uh, Rehydrated was strangely really good. It was like, for a while there, it was better than the Switch version. Now, Cosmic Shake is a tricky game to talk about without explaining a few games that it's basing so much of its identity on. Yes, I know, I heard all when, you know, you click on a video essay about a game and they just immediately jump back to 1980s uh, cinema and explain the root cause of how you need to understand Watergate in order to understand the new Crisis game or whatever. Like, meh. I don't like it but I'm going to try and make it fun. So, anyway, the year's 1942 and Spongebob has just started to hit its stride. I recently rewatched the first few seasons with my fiance and I swear those early seasons just mature like fine wine. Amazon Prime just clicked over from one season three episode to season four and I've always been a huge defender of season four through to eight, but bruh, the dip in quality was instant. But back before that dip, we were eating well at the buffet of Sponge. Just watched a couple of episodes, then switched on your PS2 and hopped into really one of three options. Now, if you were cool like me and actually had a few more options than these, but for most people, they seem to really click with one or the other. If you were unlucky and perhaps a British person, you played Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. 
On the original console, it's almost an unplayable mess. And you were probably a sad child wondering why you had to be born into a world where just landing on a simple platform seemed to just cost a little bit of your soul. Now, when it's remastered or, you know, like remastered, when it's played on Dolphin or one of those types of things, it's actually a really fun experience. I really like Revenge of the Flying Dutchman only when it's emulated on console. That thing ain't worth nobody's time. But anyway, no one cares about that. There are three games. The lamest of you in the audience probably grew up playing Spongebob, but Battle for Bikini Bottom, the bad one, if you will. A cold classic, but loved by everyone, except me. So obviously I must be the correct one, okay, I'm the correct one. It's beloved so much that they had to make a remake. A remake I also don't like. Why? Because it's boring and lame and too easy. Now, to be entirely honest, I do enjoy Battle for Bikini Bottom, but uh, it does have some huge flaws and issues that are almost entirely ignored by its fan base due to it being so tied up with nostalgia. Very few people discuss it in a fair manner. It has huge dips in quality. Some levels are just absolutely horrid with terrible visual design. The lack of core voice talent generally being way too easy, which is fine for a kid's game, but then it has these huge jumps in difficulty that can only be attributed to bad level design, considering how out of place they are. Now, for an adult, those parts are like my favorite parts, and like for the same probably for you, the levels you're thinking of are like the best levels in that game they are so much harder than everything else in that game, and it can only be attributed to bad level design. It's just incohesive. A jump of that caliber, that suddenly, and that randomly, it's like... What? <laughs> Am I supposed to think that was a good plan, or something you planned out? It's a lovely snapshot into the older days of Spongebob, and I understand why people have such a connection to it, but I've never been able to form much of a connection. As to me, it's kind of the lesser brother. Now please, consider that you are me. Here is an image of me. Yes, this is me. Yes. It's me. It's a child. A child with taste. While you were on your Xboxes and GameCubes playing Battle of Bikini Bottom, I was at home on my PS2 studying the Blade! The movie game is better in every way, no discussion. Well, I mean, you can discuss it, but... Please don't, it makes it look bad. <laughs> Uh, yes, it does have the worst difficulty spikes and absolutely terrible gatekeeping of future content behind doing damn driving missions and even those driving missions have damn ring challenges and absolutely unbeatable boss battles! But let me tell you something. All that dumb stuff, all those facts that show there is a worse experience than Battle for Bottom, ignore all those. Because when the music gets going, alright, and you start feeling it, and then you hop in your bathtub, and you're going down. There ain't nothing better. There ain't nothing better. The sliding missions in the movie game are an absolute joy. The levels are way smaller, but much tighter. Way less running between stuff. Just straight platforming from start to finish. The game is so damn hard, I can remember being stuck on just single platforming challenges or ball challenges for days on end. But guess what? I beat them. Maybe with the help of my brother, but I beat them! The movie game is a worse experience in every single way, but I would play any one of those levels over even the best levels in Battle for King Bottom. They are just so tight and challenging and just batshit insane. It's just everything but more. Yeah, 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 cool game, but irrelevant. Wanna know why? Because. I actually played Creature from the Krusty Krab way more than any of these other games. And that's for a good reason. Creature from the Krusty Krab, to a 10-year-old, is like your own imagination on steroids, okay? 
It's pumping tunes the whole way through. It's like you're smashing your SpongeBob action figure onto a Hot Wheels car and driving it around the house. This game is just sheer fun and creativity. It's honestly a real favorite of mine. Its levels drag on for a bit longer than they need to. The mini games are boring as anything, but the music, the quips, the level design, the creativity, the combination of stories into one epic finale, it's honestly the most creative we've ever seen a team take Spongebob. And for the longest time, I always said that it was just such a joy because we would never ever see something like that again. Now, if you take a snapshot a few years back, Nickelodeon, I hate Nickelodeon, okay? They were making the worst stuff around this time. They were making the worst Spongebob movies. The second and third one, incredibly horrific movies. They were releasing, they were allowing stuff like Activision's two games, Hero Pants, Re uh, Plankton's Robotic Revenge, just absolute trash. And then when they started to get a bit better, they were releasing the bloody kart racing games, the most basic stuff, where they didn't even have voice acting, just doing this stuff over and over, and these horrible iOS games that were just about sapping kids of money. Nickelodeon was the most uncreative it had ever been when I was making those types of statements, and there was just no sign of any way out of it. And now Nickelodeon as a whole isn't any better. They've just loosened the reins a little bit, mostly because they're probably just being lazy. Um, but yeah, I said, and I believe at the time, that we would never ever see something as creative as Creature from the Krusty Krab ever again. But you know what we did get? Something bigger and better and more creative in every single way. So Battle for Bikini Bottom and the movie game are something of the godfather games in this fan base. Even though many games came before them, the Heavy Iron games, ignoring the last one, are widely considered to be the best examples of Spongebob games. Combining the show's characters, locations, style, comedy, and tone into a 3D platformer that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about any AAA 3D platformer at the time, in some ways, not in other ways. Don't compare it to a Nintendo game, please. <laughs> please. They really show their age. And truth, I love Heavy Iron as much as anyone, but they made some absolute shovelware in their time. I'm just going to you know, come out with that. And this game has some... Uh, tasty little hints of that exact same shovel. Terrible management of difficulty. Artificial padding. Just as many terrible levels as there are great ones. And the boss battles that you can either do blindfolded or need a dose of energy drink just injected into your veins. They are special games. I enjoy them both. But to a wider audience outside the core fan base, they are incredibly primitive. And, you know, Creature from the Krusty Krab is just about never even in any of these discussions anyway. So, yeah, then some whack job was like, let's remake it. So I entered into the SpongeBob YouTube base around 2016, as I had recently found a YouTuber called Fred5107. I loved his content, as I had never really seen anyone else talk about these old games that I loved. I never really even made the connection in my mind that anyone else had ever 
played them. And at the time, his core focus was pushing for Battlefield Bottom to be brought to the Xbox One store or remastered. He had gathered a bit of a following as the SpongeBob community was tiny at the time, but we all kind of unanimously hated Activision. So we all kind of banded together. And this all came around the time of Activision losing the rights to make the SpongeBob games. And at this time, Fred hadn't made a video yet, and he had these large gaps between making them. And I loved the content so much that I decided I would kind of fill in with giving updates, because updates were starting to kind of come more rapidly. And I was like, well, there's no one else doing this. There's no one else talking about this. I might as well. And so I started making videos talking about news updates and all that type of stuff in between Fred releasing his big videos that were kind of the fan base's core landmarks. And this was such a fun time. There was like a hundred people who were like, I knew all of their names because I would just see them commenting on everything. It was the weirdest, but the funnest time as well. They were the OGs of the fan base. And I've been making videos for a few years before this, so I kind of slipped into it quite well. But it's important that you remember those OG people. You go back and watch any of my videos from 2016. Look at the comments. We walk in the valleys of kings. They came before us. So it took about four years of kind of consistent campaigning, a lot of sending emails. It was originally just me and Fred doing stuff, and then it grew and grew and grew to probably about 10 or so people, and then the game got announced, SpongeBob SquarePants Rehydrate, and it just kind of blew up. I have no idea how many people were in the fan base at that stage making videos. There was a lot of people. Um, yeah, and that stage Fred had already kind of taken a step back, and I was kind of getting a bit tired of just making the same kind of news content. It felt very pointless, and when there was that many other people talking about it, it didn't really seem to serve a purpose, so I took a step back. Um, but yeah, the game came out, and... Um, yeah, it's not as good as the original. It's worse in uh, quite a few different ways. But I saw a lot of potential in Purple Lamp. But I was kind of done. And it seems... It's really weird, but it seems like the SpongeBob fan base as a whole also was kind of done at that point. I've just watched... I stayed, I've stayed in contact with a handful of content creators that I kind of became friends with at that time. And I've just watched their channels as it's just slowly gotten harder and harder for them to make SpongeBob content because no one watches it anymore. I really feel like too many of us were in that pot around that time and exhausted every form of like uh, SpongeBob content. Like I remember talking to a friend and we both separately were making a video that was about to release at the same time on the same topic, on the same game. And I was like, okay, I'll I'll be nice and I'm I'm just gonna scrap the video. I'm not gonna like I don't wanna undercut them or anything like that. And uh, there was like multiple stages like that. The 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 well had very well and truly run dry. And at this point, uh barely anyone I know even bothers with it anymore. But I'm still here. How you doing? It in some kind of funny ways does feel like we're back in twenty sixteen again. Like there's barely any of us here there's like a hundred people who consistently watch the videos they're the new ogs it's kind of it's kind of sweet it's kind of, it's kind of cute i don't know the only difference is i have a beard now which does need to be trimmed <laughs> Cosmic Shake follows SpongeBob and Patrick as they receive a bottle of magic bubble soap and make so many wishes that it tears apart the fabric of the multiverse and turns Bikini Bottom into a disaster zone of mixed realities. Um, is it just me, or is anyone else getting really tired of these whole multiverse things? It's like every everyone's doing it. Um, uh, could, you, could we stop? But they do handle it quite well in this one. They, it, they use it as a good way to do new ideas and explore different stuff. It's w used well. But please don't do it again, I'm tired of it. <laughs> From cowboy jellyfish fields to Halloween rock bottom, seeing different versions of beloved characters and allowing the cast to have a bit more fun with their roles. The story serves its purpose well enough. All the stuff with Cassandra is uh, really weak and she is so overacted and underwritten. None of the jokes in her scenes land and it feels like the most forced part of the game. It finally feels like the most childish part of the game. And I always hear the same thing of like, well, it's a kid's game, so you can't like, th that, that points doesn't matter. I just watched through the first three seasons, like in their entirety. None of that show ever talks down to kids. It n is never this like blatant and in your face. Like kids deserve a lot better. <laughs> but I will say, chatting with characters in the overworld and slowly rebuilding Bikini Bottom 
doing mini games, getting quests from citizens, unlocking more of the map and better ways to traverse, that's where the story really hits so much better. Yes, it's less epic than the movie game, less creative than Creature from the Crusty Crab, and less classic than Battle for King Bottom, but it works perfectly for what the game is trying to do. And it really connects you so much more with the overworld as your actions broke it and are now setting it right. It's also just really fun being able to do more around the overworld as you unlock new abilities. And the abilities is what really sets this game apart from any other SpongeBob game, and what sets it heads above its grandfather games. Okay, so the gameplay changes in Cosmic Shake are insane. I was really holding out hope for Purple Lamp to finally really start flexing its muscles gameplay-wise and mechanic-wise since Rehydrated. And they've done it. Boy, howdy do they do it. <laughs> We have the 3D platformer standards, double jump, spin attacks, ground smash, wonderful. We have the return of sliding segments, amazing. Purple Lamp was like, yeah, moving around the map is meant to be fun. It's why we play 3D platformers. Let's double down. We can glide using a pizza box, only for a short time, but it allows for a level of increased movement as levels are very vertically focused. We have the surfboard, allowing for maximum horizontal travel, but needs to be replenished after a short time, allowing for fast-paced movement and time trials. Then there's the rolling stone, which allows for more fast-paced uh, sliding stuff with on the tongue and all that, uh, but then also more stuff in line with things that we saw in Truth or Square, a more puzzle kind of orientated, obstacle avoidance orientated slower form of that type of movement, which is really fun that we can have both. There is also horse riding, a small segments of fast paced action that requires the management of health, jumping and dashing to get through the levels. These small additions to movement allow for so much more varied level design. And what's amazing is unlike in the heavy iron games, they don't push the use of these elements to the point of making you lose your mind. There aren't a dozen sliding missions with time trials and ring trials. The game is much tighter. They never let a single gameplay style outstay its welcome. They don't fall into the issue that Creature and the Krusty Krab did as well, where every gameplay style feels just like a gimmick. They just never let you get bored of something. As soon as it's come, it's gone. The game is dialed up to 11 with all this stuff, but that's not all they added. Okay, so somehow, I don't know how, Purple Lamp has managed to make combat in a 3D platformer actually good. Not just good, great. The amount of enemies is hugely increased. You have one hitters, your grunts, slime shooters that take two hits, big boys that take three and can only be hit at certain times and need to be avoided. Then there are enemies that can only be killed after they've been stunned. The monster generator that takes three hits and will stun you and blast you back after each hit. The boxing boys that break into two smaller monsters after being hit and if you don't kill them will rejoin. Underground enemies that dig underneath you and shoot up need to be ground slammed. Flying enemies that ground slam you if you ever stop moving. Enemies that throw homing bombs at you and need to be hit away. Enemies that freeze you if they see you. At first I was kind of disappointed by how many returning types of enemies we were seeing from Rehydrated. But no, they went all out on this. So there are just so many new enemies that combat is actually really tricky. But they've given us way more tools to like go at combat that kind of offsets it a bit. We can ground slam, of course, which kills enemies around you. Throw out a bubble that stuns them. Use a homing karate kick that lets Sanjo fly around the fight with ease. Meaning mobility is now on your side. A dodge that also ups your mobility in fights and also works as a little bit of a dash. It also gives you some invincibility frames. You also occasionally get the Reef Blower, allowing you to suck up enemies and shoot them at others. The combat here is also dialed up to 11. I would have loved to see the uppercut and some type of the homing attack like the missile, but that might have just been too much to manage all at once. The combat is fast, snappy. If you aren't like utilizing all of your abilities all of the time, you will die. The moment to moment platforming is much less challenging. The challenge comes so much more from the combat changes and by mixing the combat with all these forms of movement and level design, none of it gets boring or tedious, even when trying to 100% it and doing you know, very specific things for those 100% awards. With this type of stuff, Purple Lamp is really proving what they can do, what they can make. When the gloves are off, they are showing that they can take SpongeBob games into a whole other level. They are the people that have brought SpongeBob games back 
and they're the people that can take him further than he's ever gone before. This isn't just creativity for creativity's sake, like in Creature from the Krusty Krab. This is purposeful game development that pushes everything forwards and it's fantastic. The implementation of these ideas layered on top of each other creates something really special and really fun. Diving out of the way of a bathtub smash as a horde of smaller enemies are rushing you, trying to avoid Tata Sauce as you try to get close enough to do a karate kick on a spawner. You're constantly thinking, constantly needing to be aware. You can't button mash. It won't work, and that's an incredible achievement for a 3D platformer. And a kid's game. So the combat and moment to moment gameplay is better than anything I've ever seen in these types of games. But all that's kind of a little bit pointless if you don't have really, really good levels. So let's chat about them. <laughs> Wild West Jellyfish Fields. This is the first new level of a SpongeBob game we've had in years. Enough remakes, enough crappy shovelware. This was new content, and they came out swinging. Taking inspiration from Pest of the West, an absolute highlight special in the post-movie era of SpongeBob. We are thrown into new location after new location. Vast scenery, gorgeous locations, horse riding, then a bit of platforming that feels like the spiritual next step from some stuff we saw in the movie game. Then BAM! Mrs. Puff's Riding School. Absolutely gorgeous level design. The Wild West level shows us a few things right out of the gate. Firstly, I hated the new style and rehydrated. It felt like they slapped an, a Spyro filter on classic Spongebob. I hated it there, and I hated it in the third movie, but here, it finally makes sense. It finally works. These locations are built from the ground up with these textures, styling, and lighting in mind. They flourish with it, creating absolutely gorgeous scenes with all the mood, spirit, and heart of the show. The art style is finally cohesive with the whole experience. Secondly, this level shows us their overall design goal for the game. Raise the ante, dial it up to 11, and never let an idea outstay its welcome. As I said before, the combat is dialed up and the core source of difficulty. But the levels too, with so much verticality, rather than multiple random things to do in the levels, there's a core story and then side quests, meaning everything flows together so much better and is less segmented. You can see new and old areas of the level off in the distance as you platform and blast away enemies, giving the whole level a sense of being so much more alive. And then it ends off with an almost perfect boss battle. Chasing Mr. Krabs along a speeding train, putting every skill you've learnt to the test, as all good boss battles should. It's the test at the end of the year. Think you're good at riding and avoiding stuff? Awesome, now we're throwing stuff at you as well. Uh, you, you got platforming down? Great, now do it faster. You got fighting enemies down? Great, now do it faster while platforming. Creating platforms while avoiding spikes. Fighting enemies while floors break underneath you. Going on top of the train, into compartments, it's a perfect boss sequence. And it's a little more inspired than just whacking one big enemy three times. Remember, dialed up to 11 and never letting an idea outstay its welcome. Bored of the train sequence? It's done, never doing it again. And it can be done in under three minutes, just saying. Chugging drinks at the bar, gone as soon as it's come. This obviously isn't the case for everything, but it honestly makes every level so much more replayable. Only in this level will I get an experience like this one. It's so cool. And then the music. It's just a, a fabulous couple of tunes. Every track in the soundtrack stands toe to toe with anything that comes before. Does it compete with Creature from the Crusty Crab? It's to be decided. But here, it's got a wonderful country feel while still managing to sound kind of beachy and coastal. And it's also got like a nice funky tone to it as well. It fits perfectly with riding your horse, but also just some general SpongeBob antics. It's real good. It's real good. Cool. Get the bass going. All right. So the crazy level of this game 
If this isn't the absolute best one-two punch, then I don't know what is. Like, dude, one second we're chasing down a train, doing one of the best boss sequences. Next, we are learning the karate kick, a fundamental change to the entire 3D platforming system, and doing actual scenes for an action movie, being berated the entire time by Squidward to do it faster and better and be less short. Like, bruh, nothing else competes. We get some just better platforming sequences too. Brand new enemies, not just reskins from Battle from Giddy Bottom, that fundamentally change how you can approach combat. We also get a slew of fun references and nods, but none of them are invasive or annoying. Like, I can't tell you how annoying I found it that in Rehydrate, just randomly, you're running around SpongeBob's house and there's a picture of a meme on the wall. Like, how world-breaking and just lazy is that? It feels like the most Twitter thing ever. The most out-of-touch, like, SpongeBob fan idea ever. It was the dumbest thing. And the fact that if you let SpongeBob just sit, he just randomly does different meme poses. It was so dumb. But here, the implementation of it is way less invasive and way better and actually cohesively works. Now, yes, there are some stuff like there's just randomly a poster there that's a scene from a SpongeBob episode. But then you have really cool implementation, like how the production logo for Squidward's production company is the handsome Squidward face, which makes sense because this Squidward is just such an egomaniac and so obsessed with himself that of course that's how he's going to see himself and that's how he's going to be his logo. Like it makes perfect sense and it's a really cool idea. It just feels way better than just, oh, we put the uh, actual picture from the show just to get a, you know, like a wink and a nod from the audience. Uh, we don't know what episode it's from though, and neither do you guys, but yeah, it's, it's you know, SpongeBob is probably from the first three seasons. Everyone likes those ones, right? Yeah. Just those ones. It's also really nice to see a movement away from the obsession with the first three seasons. Something too is facial animation, and animation as a whole is so much better than Rehydrated. I think it's part of having stuff built from the ground up with the new art style in mind. In Rehydrate, it just it greatly was hampered. Everything, every reaction was hampered by the new art style. Here, faces are more expressive, motion is more cartoony but so fluid. Moving from one action to another is way cleaner. Action animations look way more natural. Overall, the animation is just so much nicer. We also see some fun little side activities to do, like posing for photos and riding your little scooter thing against traffic. It's fun stuff like this, which just manages to stay away from feeling gimmicky because they're done as soon as they begin. But they work wonderfully as kind of like palette cleansers. And then the music is so jazzy. That damn bass line. It feels like a 90s cop show that just got smashed in the face by a classic kung fu flick with just a hint of crime noir. It just rolls on and on, raising the tension into a blast and then bringing it back down, back into these dirty streets. It's like a rolling thunderstorm, breaking into lightning and then just slowly going back with a rumble. It's so cool with superb visual design, heaps of fun character interactions, really inspired missions like the camera scrolling segments and the karate kick, paired with the horse riding, massive scopes and heights of the, and just the superb boss battle from before. These first two levels of Cosmic Shake are like, just they're nearly perfect. It's a nearly perfect one-two punch start to the game. That is so cool. Alright, how about we take a breather and head back into the hub world. The hub world of Cosmic Shake is honestly just really a, a fun idea. Showing the impacts of the Cosmic Shake and then also showing your slow fix of it by returning locations, fixing some locations, but also returning characters to their rightful place. It's a really novel idea and I really enjoy it. Now I have been fairly glowing of the game so far, but let's talk uh, shop for a moment. So. Through my playthrough across multiple consoles, the core issue of the game is that last 10 to 20% of polish. Now, why that margin of difference? It's about the version that you play it on. PC, it's more of like a 10%. 
lack of polish. Console is getting towards that 15 to 20 percent that it's really missing. Now, what are these issues? Well, overall, performance and optimization is as good as you would expect, much better than in Rehydrated in just about every way. But we still suffer some issues. On console, I experienced many freezes. Once every 15 to 20 minutes, I just randomly freeze for about two seconds, and then it would snap back. Not as bad as the amount of crashes I experienced with Rehydrated, but it is annoying. I'll talk about my experience with 100%ing the game and how a lot of these issues only became more apparent as I got through that, but we'll come to that. On console, there was also some strange amounts of anti-aliasing on models, weird checkerboard stuff. Only saw it occasionally. Also, generally, there's just too many times where sound effects were clearly meant to play and it didn't in a cutscene, or the audio was out of sync, or in fact, it restarted mid-cutscene a few times. Like, for instance, the final cutscene of the entire game. It, rather than playing music, it played the audio from the hub world, which would be fine, except my character, because obviously he had spawned back into the hub world while this scene was still covering my screen, and so there were some nearby enemies, and so they were just attacking me. So the entire time while I'm trying to listen to these characters talk and like finish off the story, I'm just hearing bah, bah, ow, ah, bah, do death sound effect, reload in, monster yell, bah, da, ah, type of stuff like the entire time. It, it kind of ruined the moment a little bit. There's just a layer of polish missing, but that like last month of development time, just weird transitions between gameplay and cutscenes with music suddenly ending and then uh, no music in the cutscene and then jolting back into gameplay. Some cutscenes are like perfectly implemented with conversations perfectly melding into cutscenes and then back into gameplay with perfect music transitions, which shows that this isn't an issue of competence, just time. The positive is all of these can be fixed with patches, which they've already been doing, also, just about none of these issues were on PC, except for the weird transitions. But it did, like, it just gives the whole experience a bit of a more novice feel than it really deserves when you're just going along and then the music just hard snap cuts and we're into a cutscene that for some reason doesn't have music and they're slightly out of sync and then hard cuts back to gameplay. The music's blaring again. Like, it feels very novice -y. Okay, well, the hub world is a little boring at this point. We'll come back when we've unlocked more stuff. Now, I do need to mention the costumes. While it's not as fundamental to the game as I would have liked, I do also like the it isn't just a copy of Mario Odyssey by making the costumes like do stuff. It's just a fun little addition. Now, the pirate level has some really fun stuff. Also, uh, after the really close, small-scale platforming of the Crafty level, it's nice to get some wider areas, bigger vistas, and more distance-based platforming. We also get the addition of the lasso once again, and they finally fixed the lasso from the previous game. It was, like, the most annoying change in Rehydrated, and kind of made it feel like everything Purple Lamp, like, touched was made worse, and everything they kept the same was good. It was a bad, it, it, it wasn't a good first impression. But here, they've really improved it by making it more of like a, a whip forwards. So the motion makes a bit more sense because you get that, uh, like, bigger impact leaving that sends you further. In the last game, you had this quick whip, uh, like, motion, but then you still didn't get that motion carried through, so the energy of it makes a lot more cohesive sense. It feels way better. You can kind of calibrate it in your mind a lot easier. It's still not as good as just a normal swing, but it's way better here. Once again, we have just absolutely gorgeous locations that work perfectly with uniting the new style and the feel of the show. We see some more mini-games, the in-air boost editions, better use of the surfboard as well as some new enemies, and generally a tougher feel. Way more enemies, consistently being shot at by Prawn. This level is like a touch harder than the past two, which was definitely needed. I will say this level isn't as good as the first two. It's got a weak boss battle and lacks some platforming to really dig my teeth into. Combat-wise, it's a pretty great level, but I need a bit more platforming. I'd say it's as good as like the Goo Lagoon level in Rehydrated, but the lack of a satisfying boss battle brings it down a touch. Musically, it's fabulous. It's so upbeat, classic pirate shanty type of feel, and then breaks into this like school camp childlike whistle. It's like a bunch of kids are playing pirates and we are jumping in and out of their imagination. 
can feel a little stereotypical, but it's got so many layers. Like the ukulele in the back, the steel drum, it's just a, a shoe tapper, like no doubt. And a tiny bit of reverb occasionally just really makes it feel like the band has just jumped into the ocean and you've gone down there with them and then you burst back out and the reverb goes away and you're right there with them again. The level isn't as superb as the other levels, but the music keeps it in my good books. And I mean, how can you really complain when it's followed up by the best level ever in the SpongeBob game? Bruh, Halloween begin by them. Every game has its best level. I didn't expect it to be this. Okay, I didn't expect it to be this one. Purple Lamp took, in my mind, one of the low point levels of Bikini Bottom. It's like, it's just a gorgeous level. It's so accurate, so fantastic, but it's a sprawling mess. Like you start one mission, then you find you're halfway through another one. You've got the ball rolling stuff through it. Everything's overlapping on top of each other. It's just a visual and cohesive mess. It's gorgeous, but man, I don't enjoy playing it. I enjoy the start. Everything else is just bleh. I just never enjoyed it as much as others. But here, they have transformed it into the absolute pinnacle of this game. Incredible mood and visual design. The sneaking enemy is such a cool addition. I wish they had utilized them more in, in, in combat, but once again, they never push an idea further than it needs to go. The whole world has such a deliciously creepy vibe. The Halloween town is so magical. It feels almost like Tim Burton-esque. The whole level has a very has like very few enemies, as this level is mostly just focused on running around, exploring, talking to citizens, and just being immersed in this little area and doing little side stuff. The snail race is a weird but perfectly tone-fitting little segment. The sliding segments are just as good as anything from the previous games, but once again not pushed to the point of exhaustion as it is there. The shadow puppet segment was just also really fun. Level design as a whole in this is just fantastic. It's just like this combination of rock bottom, but then also the dump level as well. And it's just that whole like tone and feel is just so cool. And you also have this whole kind of feel of like the B-movie version of Bikini Bottom from Creature from the Krusty Krab. It's just fabulous. And the music. The start is just almost like chimes going off in the dark. Then that classic old cinema droning alien feel. And then you just move into this, like, sounding almost like voices in the deep, echoing up as you make your way to the city. It's a slow waltz of a song. It spirals in with some violin before bringing in this slow, mystery, Tintin-esque feel. Then building back up into this B-movie-inspired old horror movie style. This four-minute-long song is absolutely perfect. It stands up with the very, very best from any video game soundtrack. It is honestly incredible. I don't have the words to describe it anymore. I go just go and listen to it and play the level. The two of them, just this cohesive. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And paired with a perfectly thematic boss battle that once again builds on the skills acquired in that level from the new enemies, continuing the trend of just wonderful synergy between the level's gameplay and the boss battles. It's so sweet. This level is just a delight from start to finish. The cream of the crop, and it is superb. Prehistoric Kelp Forest is better than normal Kelp Forest. That's the best quality it has going for it. Now, in all seriousness, this is another really good level. The introduction of probably the most creative enemy type we've seen in a SpongeBob game, which once again requires you to entirely rethink how you handle enemy scenarios. We also get the implementation of the lava ball segments, more in line with the sliding missions from Truth of Square. These seg segments are more obstacle avoidance and traversal focus than sliding missions or horse riding. We also have running and sliding segments with a collapsing cave behind you, adding a level of like necessity to actually go fast, which the rest of the game never really pushes you to do. You have to go fast to beat these. They're a nice flavor addition, and once again, don't outstay their welcome. Overall, I'd say Kelp Forest is either as good or maybe a little bit better than the pirate level. 
mostly because it's very concise with some of the best sliding segments we've ever seen. A really cool sequence with one of those big monsters from the SpongeBob BC episode, and a far better boss battle than the pirate level. It's not as good as the other ones, because it doesn't require you to utilize, you know, your ground slamming or any type of skills you learn in that level, but it's better than the terrible prawn one. It's also kind of just fun to see them doing the caveman talk again, even though they call him Squidward instead of Squag. I don't know why they did that. Music-wise, it's another jam, but I find it there's a little less personality and evolution to it. Might just not be my thing. It's got a nice groove and bass line to it, but it's lacking a bit of energy. I need less groove, man. More jam. You know what I mean? Now then, it's been a little while. What's going on back at home? Well, we have much of Bikini Bottom back in place now. We have a handful of quests given to us that at first I thought was just going to be busy work, but honestly, these additions really make the game for me, encouraging so much more replayability. For instance, finding Mr. Crab's lost pennies, Patrick's sticky notes, finding the location of spot in every world, finding a potion to save Gary, Mrs. Puff's good noodle stars. But you also now have a heap of challenges in these worlds, like making Krabby Patties, finding collectibles, and doing small puzzles. They really decked out the world with heaps of things to do. It's easily the best hub world we've ever seen. It's just a joy to slowly reclaim the world piece by piece. Okay, now medieval sulfur fields. Inspired very by a very fun old special as well. It's really like impressive level. Starting with a sliding mission, then a tower descent, right into a maze, running around a wonderfully designed castle, then off to find a witch's hut. This level is just so perfectly thematic. It's ab honestly just an absolute joy. Can I also just say, not sure if it's in the other games, but I love the little hop up SpongeBob can do if he just misses a platform. It's, it's really nice. That's what I mean by the nice new animation. It's just this little. I don't know what I'm talking about either. Also, can I just say thank god they finally removed the absolutely horrific fog from the past games. I felt like I couldn't see an inch in front of my nose, and all the levels were so just obscured in so much fog compared to the original. These levels are just so gorgeous and so artfully put together, I'm so glad I can finally actually see them. This level also features some of the finest challenges to do while you explore, with so many hidden goodies. Also, the music is just such a triumphant little number. Jaunty yet dignified, groovy yet orchestral. It's the biggest sounding and feeling song in the soundtrack. Uh, except for one. It also morphs and evolves as the song goes on, so it never gets tiresome or bland as it plays. I also think the change to a more narratively focused levels works so much better. The style of gameplay in uh, Balfour Bottom and the movie game worked for its time, but Spongebob is all about its story and writing, so focusing more on that is never a bad thing. It also means that the levels are much tighter and there's like, there's just no dead air. With that, this level does make it rather apparent that Purple Lamp struggles with difficulty when it comes to platforming. Overall, the platforming here is not anything of a challenge in any of the levels. If you've ever beaten even the easiest platforming challenge in the movie game, you can do anything here. Purple Lamp struggles, I think, with this, but the positive of that means that it doesn't have the huge leaps and troughs of difficulty that the Heavy Iron games were plagued by. Absolutely abysmal difficulty management there. Here, the difficulty comes mostly from the combat, which does mean the platforming can be a little simple. Mm, okay, so mm, I'm just going to have a little... <laughs> if Halloween Rock Bottom is the best level in the game, this one's trying real hard to dethrone it. This is probably the smallest level in the game. You can smash through it, like, real quick. But holy shit, this level is incredible. Patrick is whisked away from you at the start of the level, and for the first time, SpongeBob is all alone, and it works really well. Purple Lamp are honestly incredible at mood setting. They've proven that two times now in this game alone. Jelly Glove World 
is the closest we will ever get to a SpongeBob horror game. It's creepy, uncomfortable, sickly sweet, and like slightly demonic. From every megaphone, Glovey shrieks and cackles insults at you. SpongeBob and his best friend so because he only cares about himself. Isn't that sad? Boo -boo. <laughs> Upon every wall is Patrick's face being tormented by the deranged mascot. The whole location is half sinking in an instant death ooze. Rides are crooked, buildings half submerged. The tongue of glove boats rise and fall out of the ooze. The lights are dim, and holy shit, the music! We start off with this childlike circus song. Then the drums come in, and it explodes in your face, fully orchestral, incredibly epic, then it pulls back, just a creepy melody, with slightly out of place instruments. It slowly grows and grows, then picks up the pace, like a dancing clown growing faster and faster, then it kicks in, half wheezing sounding, almost broken, the instruments sound out of tune, half decaying as they play their melodies. Then it really kicks in. It's honestly incredible. Okay. This song alone beats everything Creature of the Crusty Crab has to offer. As this haunting piece follows you, you continue. There are barely any enemies. The level as a whole is your enemy, as you complete little side quests and beat different challenges, making your way closer and closer to the top of Glove World, where Glovey blames you for everything that has happened, for cursing him to have no one to entertain. You then jump into a boss battle, where you acquire a whole brand new item at the very end of the game, the Reef Blob. An absolutely incredibly implemented tool that they give to you right at the end, if it was a worse developer, they would have given this to you straight away and made you use it to absolute death. But once again, they dial it up to 11 and never let an idea outstay its welcome. You battle Glovey as this bizarre, unhinged song plays behind it all. It's so reminiscent of some of the tunes in Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. What a level. Absolute perfection. And what a final one. So then, yeah, after coming from such a high point, you have a level of expectation for the ending, um, which... Yeah, the ending's really bad. It's a really bad boss battle. It only uses the Reef Blower, which is really dumb. All the other boss battles typically, you know, all the Heavy Iron ones, all their final boss battles were a challenge. It said, if you can't beat this, go back and play more. You're not ready to beat it yet. There was a platforming challenge. It was a combat challenge. It was a puzzle challenge. It was all of that. You had to be good at the game to beat the final boss. And sometimes they went way too far with that. But here, this is, I think, the easiest boss in the whole game. And it just comes out of nowhere, and it's the most janky, the transition in, the transition out, the issues of cutscenes, all this, it just feels like the most novice thing. Like they had way more plans for more stuff, and then they just ran out of time and had to be like, alright, game end. It was a bland end point. But it wasn't really the end. As I said, you would slowly receive quests from every major character to go and collect some stuff from previous levels. Well, let me just say, this stuff is what made this game for me. I have never 100 percent a game before, I've never had the urge. This stuff made the game. Going back through the levels, there is new stuff to see, new stuff to find, new dialogue, sometimes new whole scenes, more people to talk to, more challenging platforming to complete in order to get the new stuff, new areas, really tricky expectations. Like finishing boss battles in under three minutes, beating boss battles without taking any damage, and so many more. 100% in Cosmic Shake is one of the funnest things I have ever done. Coming at levels with these amazing tunes 
scouring every corner, every nook, talking to more people, doing more challenges, coming to old levels with new abilities, letting me approach segments with entirely new methods. It's like the game is entirely reinvented. To, to beat the game the first time, it took me about eight hours. To 100%, it was 15. Just do it, just do it. I'd highly recommend it. There's almost no point in playing the game if you're not going to 100% it. The rewards are super fun to just slowly tick off. But I will say something else that is worth noting is in my process to 100% it, the issues that were less apparent did become more apparent. The cracks started to show in just the general programming. For instance, the amount of freezes seemed to increase and when you're doing a boss battle where you need to complete it in under three minutes and the game freezes for a few seconds, twice in a row. It really throws you off. Or how, you know, how about if you need to defeat an enemy, defeat a boss without taking a single hit of damage. You get hit because you freeze or just, you know, because it's a boss battle. And then you realize you can't exit a boss battle in the menu. You can't jump to another level, jump to the hub world or hit a retry button or anything. You have to finish the boss battle be loaded back to the hub world, which on console, the loading takes a while. And then load back into that level, skip the first cutscene, and do it again. And if you exit out of the game, exit the main menu, and exit back, you are put back into where you were in the boss battle. How could you have not programmed in a retry button? And, and when you need to do boss battles six or seven times in a row to perfect them, to be able to finish these awards, it really starts to show, okay? Like, it's not super annoying. The boss battles take at longest, like, two minutes, three minutes. But still, I should just be able, like, oh, I got hit. Retry. It took something that should have been a ten minute process into an hour long process. How did you not program that in? How did you not program a retry button into the boss battles? What? <sighs> yeah, so that's literally that is my only real issue with the game is when I was 100%ing it I didn't have a retry button boo hoo but there you have it that's Spongebob Squarepants The Cosmic Shake I have to say this game is absolutely fantastic and that's me as an adult saying that I can't imagine how much I would have adored this game as a kid and honestly that's something really special it's amazing that young Spongebob fans have a game that I believe to so greatly surpass anything Heavy Iron ever made. The absolute best Spongebob game ever made. Taking old, faithful, yes, but out of date gameplay methods from the old games and revolutionizing them in a game with absolutely no low points. No breaks, no cracks, back-to-back -back amazing levels with a couple absolutely incredible ones thrown in. Where 100% of the game is just as fun as any other part of the game with incredible visuals, superb music, great writing, fun but challenging combat and never-ending love for the source material and a desire to dial everything up but never settle to burn out ideas. Kids today are stuck with absolute crap. iOS games that just nickel and dime them. Games that never end, don't have a story, and just all they're trying to do is get the kids into their shops to buy more stuff. It's like, what absolute crap? And then there's something like this, and it's just, how special is that? It's amazing. It's so special to us as older fans, I just can't even imagine how special it's going to be to younger fans. And as they get older, to be able to look back to a game like this and say, oh, it was as good as I remember it being. That's really cool and that's really special. This game is going to be their battle for Bikini Bottom, their creature from the Krusty Krab, their movie game. And it's also mine. And I truly hope this game sells well. I've bought three copies of this game. Please go out and buy another copy. Buy it for the Switch, buy it for the console, buy it on PC, please. They, like, with the amount of just crap there is out there, we need to support this type of stuff. And if this is what Purple Lamp can give us when they've given just been given a bit more creative freedom, if this is what they're cooking, then I want another meal. I want 
a trilogy. I want them to do what Heavy Iron was never able to do. Have an incredible trilogy of games. That would be insane. If this is what they're doing now, I can't wait to see more. So please, support them. Let's get more stuff like this. Employee of the Month is still better though. Okay, now, should I let you out of the cage? Yeah, you like that idea? You like that idea? Get back to freedom? Sure. Or, would you like to listen to me make a, uh, a series about, you know, putting every SpongeBob game into a tier list? Stop shaking your head. I know you want that. Uh, can I just say, uh, I've... I've now that I've finished the script. I went back and watched uh, a few other reviews. I haven't watched any stuff from creators, just kind of the big platforms. Because if anyone remembers uh, IGN's video on Rehydrated, it was a bit funny, so I wanted to see how they went off it all. Um, bruh, IGN, I don't know how you managed to make a review that's wrong on just about every point. But also, can I say, how have you guys not worked out how to record a game so that it doesn't look like it's in black and white? Like, what? I, I thought you guys were, you know, professionals. Also, could you just please stop comparing practically a double-A platformer that's being bankrolled by the stingiest company alive, made in two years by a company with next to no experience, to fucking Mario Odyssey and the new Ratchet and Clank game, okay? Can you, do you think you can do that? Do I need to explain why that doesn't work? You know, the game's being bankrolled by Sony and being developed by Insomniac Games, okay? Like the Golden Boys and just being given as much money as they want. You know, people with decades of experience. So you're comparing them to that, you know, Sony's flagship titles by their one of their flagship companies. And then also, you know, Nintendo, with the best game developers in the world, being able to work on these games for as long as they need, as long as they like, with as much money as they want, the best developers in the world. And the same thing for bloody Insomniac Games, they've got as long as they want with that type of stuff. You're then comparing that to a game made by, like, a tiny team that's made one other platformer that's being bankrolled by Nickelodeon with two-year turnaround times? That's like slapping a, a, a damn tiny development team for making, you know, just like small comedy stuff, small comedy short films that are like critical darlings or something like that, like tiny budget films that are these like intricate dramas. It's like backhanding them for not making Avengers Endgame. It, it's a different weight class. It's a different world. You can't just compare every... Like, yes, I understand they exist in the same, like, uh, competitive market as each other, but so does every indie film and small budget film with Avengers Endgame. Yet they still have a following, they still win awards, people still really enjoy those. It's a different weight class. Literally, all they did in this review is compare this game to Mario Odyssey, different weight class, and these other better platformers. People play these games because they want a Spongebob game. And also, it's just... Could you ever just critique the game on its own merits, on its own mechanics? Because there is stuff to critique there. You can you can create a negative review from this game. Like, if you come at it with the mindset you already have of just disliking everything that isn't Mario Odyssey, there is stuff to critique it if you actually critique it on its own merit, on its own gameplay, on its own mechanics, on its own, like... Do your damn job! Like, just for instance, to prove that you have not done your job, you claim that this game is identical to Rehydrated. Did you play it? You just shared your job. It's, it's, it's fine. Doesn't mean I need to be happy about it or give you an excuse. You just shared your job. Literally, there is not a sentence he says in this that he doesn't immediately contradict at some point in the review. He contradicts himself on every point. 
there is no cohesive actual argument in this. The, this can be entirely summed up as meh. Should have played Mario Odyssey. I don't know, I could make, like, so many videos talking about the abhorrent reviews this game got. You should check out a video, I'll leave it in the description, um, about reviewer bias. And it was kind of focused around the difference between story games like The Last of Us and all that, and how IGN they sort of treat platformers. Like, they're, they've run it through, like, all of their reviews, and they metrically give platformers, like, a 1.4 lower rating across the board no matter what and it's like it's just even more con like consistent with all this type of stuff just the level of bias and the level of all that type of stuff is just insane so i'll link that down below um but yeah i'm um i'm done with talk i'm pretty tired of talking now so <laughs>